Surprise. Surprise. <laughs> yeah. Um, surprise. Yeah, I thought we'd uh, maybe talk about uh, surprises that you know, we found in the mm-hmm. course of our spiritual practices. Mm. Such a long list, I mean, <laughs> uh, <laughs> which is part of the surprise, I think. Yeah, uh, yeah. Surprise number one is that it's not a thing, uh, that it's not an experience to be had. Mm-hmm. Um, and that that phenomenon of it not being an experience to be had actually allows you to deal with endless ongoing surprises, mm-hmm. right? Things that had formerly represented a shock. It's not so much um, that they don't happen, which I think was somebody's expectation that mm-hmm. things would just stop happening, that were uh, negative and that there would be celestial music that accompanied right. each right. moment, although there is, um, is instead that surprises no longer appear as surprise or as so shocking. And yet at the same time, the joy and novelty of life only intensifies. So that would be uh, one aspect of the surprise that this, absence of any endpoint or absence of any kind of um, experience per se actually deepens and almost renders it uh, more joyful Mm -hmm. uh, in its ongoing activity. I think that's one of the mistakes that a lot of people make pedagogically, is that word, that um, they think it's a gold medal. It's an Olympic gold medal that they can claim and pin around their neck and wear a little badge of some sort. And in fact, as you point out, that's one of the most limiting things you could do. I mean, the last thing you'd want to do in an unfolding process, an awakening process, is to freeze it by saying, okay, you know, you've, you've won the gold medal, now that's it. Because then you're kind of destroyed because you're fixed, locked into this place of, <clears throat> okay, I'm done now. And you find out, well, things keep changing. And so I must not have been done before or else I'm doing something wrong because I'm supposed to be this thing. And I must not be that because I'm no longer frozen. So let me carry out some exercises in order to protect that thing that I thought I was going to be for a while. Um, yeah, that's, that's definitely one of the surprises. I think the other uh, surprise, maybe, uh, the, the way we could put it, it's just how ordinary mm-hmm. it is. Uh, that, and, and by that I mean is that, there, uh, that one experiences the ordinary as itself kind of full of all kinds of miraculous capacity that appears to have been there all along. Um, the mon- most mundane encounter, say in the middle of the night, I was driving back from an airport and I meet somebody who's making me a sandwich. And because I'm there and not thinking, oh, you know, what time am I going to get home? Uh, you know, how do I get myself into this situation? Right. <clears throat> There's a really magical quality to the most sort of ordinary of interactions. So even though there isn't a, an experience per se, there is a flavor and a richness to ordinary experience that exceeds any experience I could have ever imagined having achieved Mm -hmm. as a part of this process. Yeah. Yeah, I think the, the, the sweetness we've, we've talked about before that, uh, that attends this being now, now, now. And people have talked about, well, it's just past, present, future. And they're all the same, just passing the time. And in fact, that's not the case, in my experience. I think of yours either, that this, this now, now, now thing has a tremendously different uh, content to it, richness to it, than past or future, which are just storylines. And as you say, the most prosaic, the most mundane possible thing happens, and it's just ongoing beautiful, fantastic unfolding. It's so much deeper than anything you could ever have brought into that space before, no matter what you took or what you did or what your what your practice was. Yeah, so I suppose a kind of a corollary to that is, is you know, after ordinary is simple. Mm-hmm. That uh, one of the sort of, uh, sort of refrains that I think I feel when I'm able to most let go and be in this... Uh, space is the surprising and well nigh astonishing simplicity mm-hmm. of it you know that um it's really not an epic uh 
epically complex phenomenon. It's a phenomenon that is right with you, within you at all times. You just never learned how to tarry with it and actually look there, right? So I was working with some people in an academic context uh, last week, and it felt like, you know, I was just pointing out that they had never looked at a particular place, which mm -hmm. was the ground of their awareness, mm -hmm. that they were always looking at some content of their awareness. And it was almost like, you know, for some of them, they were slapping themselves in the forehead and saying, I just never looked there. You know, it's as if you've had a, a you know, I don't know, some kind of post-it note right. on your forehead no your entire you. life, and you never realized that right. it was there. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And the post-it note said, Ordinary experience is totally miraculous if only you'll actually pay attention to it. What well, sensation, too, of it? It's so close. I mean, so intimate. So even more than intimate. So right, so there all the time that you can't believe you looked past it for so long. Yeah. I mean, it's like you're going around the supermarket looking for some sort of item mm -hmm. to put in your cart, you know, and the cart itself is the thing that you're looking uh, to yeah. put in the, the cart. It's... Yeah. Um, yeah. It's astonishing in its clarity um, and its immediacy. Yeah. One thing we've talked about, too, is that desires change. The nature of desire changes because um, you don't have the flywheel of self-referential narrative thought to amplify every desire into a wild craving or every tiny slight into a raging uh, episode. So, you know, you, you really get back to the very, what's the biological uh, amount of that that is not mediated by thought. And you can see, well, it's very different than what you thought it was. Right. So uh, the very thing that probably launches many of us into any kind of inquiry or spiritual quest whatsoever is itself a kind of craving, right, or desire. Mm -hmm. It's like, I, I want... I, I want to feel better. I want to not feel that way. And it really is surprising that I think I imagined that I was just going to be able to deal with those kind of cravings better. Like, you know, you know, I want sex. I want drugs. I want, you know, endless amounts of food. Uh, I want, you know, money. And I think what is surprising is that those things all persist, but the I want disappears right. or at least approaches asymptotically zero. Right. And I think that is so surprising because we have this more or less bodily habit structure to sort of, you know, where we get into situations and our expectations are already there, cued. Okay. And this is the time in which you will want and action. That's right. And then the, the wanting isn't that there. Doesn't the wanting just doesn't occur. <laughs> that is maybe the most surprising yeah. thing yeah. Uh, that can happen because those wants are so convincing, mm -hmm. right? That um, even when you're, th you're thinking like, "Oh, I'm you know, I'm, I'm, I'm working on transcending that," you know, right. that I think implicitly we think of that in a repressive sense. We think that well. I'm just going to be able to control myself right. when these things come around, as opposed to the wanting itself is gone, which is different in some way that's hard to put into language from the desire and the appreciation being gone, mm -hmm. right? Like things are, if anything, more beautiful and attractive and uh, astonishing. I, I, you know, I don't resent money. I don't, resent beauty. I don't resent, you know, material objects. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't seek to negate them. They're just there. And they either come into my field of awareness or they don't come into my field of awareness. And there's no craving. Well, the surprising thing, too, is that if you take, you know, sensual pleasures, take sex, for example, I mean, it, it's much more acute. I mean, it's much more intense because you aren't mentally mediating it. I mean, it's just when, when it does pass your field, there's just nothing gets in the way of the pure experience. And in the past, you know, there's always a storyline. Even if you try to enjoy you know, almost anything, there's always a, you come in with all kinds of perhaps media-enhanced 
visions of how this or this or this should be. Even if this is just the media is just your noggin. Exactly. Exa- yeah. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And but it's it's you know impossible to parse that out until you say, okay, what if we just drop that away? This yeah. whole mediation process falls away, and then you're just left with the pure experience. Right. So I think the way I might put it is, before part of the association of the craving is that sex or some other extraordinary experience was always about to be mm-hmm. it was incipient you know <laughs> i was i was you know on the trigger you yeah. know uh, always hunting. Always Where, hunting. whereas now as you point out yes always hunting whereas now sex is mm-hmm. <laughs> capital i capital s mm-hmm. because you're not anywhere else it and and then that isness extends to everything else in your ordinary experience right, right? like your cereal in the morning if you're mm-hmm. having it is mm-hmm. uh, a cup of tea yeah. oh, is right. and that isness is so extraordinary that there's no room for craving like you know how could you possibly want anything else like as i said the habit structure remains where part of your body kind of goes around and says okay now we're about to get our you know little hit of fill in the blank right. no need well, in the brain, as we've, we've discussed, uh, turns out the brain does like this space, prefers it, and it neurally enhances that, and perhaps even uh, dopamine uh, reinforces the situation because it does feel as if you become so content in this space. And content not as in a bad way, but just in this space totally now, 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 that movement out of that, whether it's movement of thought or movement of desire or movement of fear, just isn't interesting. It just isn't something that would come in and intrude in that space because the space is so compelling by itself. And, you know, Mama Harshi says, you know, you will find after a while that you'll have a hard time thinking. It's difficult to make thoughts occur because <laughs> the brain says, no, that's not cool. We yeah. don't want to do that. This is, space is so much better and much richer than that. But again, to be clear, it's a hard time thinking self-referential thoughts mm-hmm. it, as opposed to the incredible flow and stream of completely elaborated ideas that float by that I wasn't noticing before because I was too busy thinking about what ideas I had to come up with. There's so much <laughs> bandwidth consumed by self-referential blah, blah, you know, 90x percent of most people that you know, the good stuff, the inspirations and the problem solutions and the insight could hardly find their way through that maze to get up to be recognized. And now you've got all this open bandwidth, and this can just spread out, so, and you're much more still, so you're more likely able to see one of these inspirations when they arise. And I think that's why, before, it felt like surprise was a, a almost like automatically rare event. Because what it was, was some of those already elaborated ideas, perhaps, you know, like the aha moment, mm-hmm leaking through or mm-hmm. sneaking through the self-referential thoughts like oh, don't bother me i'm coming up with an idea you know right. uh whereas if you if if people will kind of meditate or pause on it think about that moment of what it feels like when you feel a surprising thought come into being that is the closest to the feeling tone of how it feels almost all the time mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. that emergence you know something is coming in out of out of nothing right. 